Hi there, Simon from simonwoods.com. I have six wines in front of me, and I'm uh, sh bear with me, there is a theme uh, that is going on here. Uh, vaguely Burgundian grapes, uh, even though um, in the scheme of things, uh, purists would dis not describe any of them as coming from Burgundy. But the first two are from southern Burgundy, uh, Beaujolais, and uh, so the Gamay grape, which we will come back to uh, later on uh, in the tasting, but uh, let's set in, with, set in with these two Beaujolais. First one is Harvey Nichols' own label, Beaujolais Village, 2012, made for them by Philippe Vermorel. Now, it was a tricky vintage 2012 uh, in Beaujolais. Weird thing is, Burgundy had a, a, a pretty decent 2012. The Rhone had a nice 2012. Not huge crops, but uh, good. Beaujolais between the two of them. Uh, and they had real problems with, uh, uh, with, with rain around harvest time. And a lot of the grapes ended up getting a little bit rotten. So you smell quite a lot of the 2012s. And they have this uh, dusty, grey rot character. Here, I stick my nose in. None of that. Uh, it's got this... Um, it's quite almost like cooked uh, uh, rosehip syrup, plummy, uh, sweet, sweet strawberry character. Uh, it smells, uh, it smells good, and there's like a, a slight undercurrent of um, of earthiness about it too, which um, I, I, I get this earthy character in quite a lot of Beaujolais, at, uh, but it smells, it smells okay. Yeah, the rosehip. I think that's a. Uh, I never thought of, um, of Beaujolais having that uh, that rosehip character, but I, I do get that there. Um, not astounding wine, but um, refreshing. Um, it's on. It's, it's funny. It's, 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 it's turned into a rather lovely warm day here, and uh, they, these have been out of the cellar for a, a few hours. And uh, maybe I'm tasting them slightly too warm, but um, I'd, I'd, I'd stick that in the in the fridge for uh, 20 minutes before serving it, and uh, at the temperature it is now, maybe stick it in for half an hour or more. Uh, but uh, I like it. There is a little edge of that slight hardness that makes me think that they didn't quite get all of the uh, um, ever so slightly not healthy grapes out, but um, it's good. Uh, let's see whether we can better it with a wine from a more prestigious appellation and a better vintage. So this is Henri Fessy Morgan 2011. Give this one a whirl. Sweeter, um, fleshier fruit here. It's strange. It's not on that jammy, uh, cooked side that I was I was getting on the first one, uh, but it just feels like it, there's more concentration here of fresher fruit. Um, so that it, we are back in the, in the raspberries, the plums, uh, a little bit of the red cherries in here. Uh, but it's just that extra layer of depth that you feel you sense something has gone on here to um, uh, make it a more ambitious and more successful wine. And that's what good Beaujolais does. Um, that hardly any other wines in the world do. Provides full flavour in light to medium bodied wine. Um, so there is, I, I, it's funny, I still feel uh, quite a bit of uh, a whack of structure, so of, of acidity and tannin coming through. Uh, but it's this lithe, gentle, uh, refreshing, crunchy fruit on top of it. A little bit of the red currants, um, those raspberries and cherries in particular. And uh, this succulence that makes you want to have something that is on that uh, uh, hearty uh, with sweet fattiness in there. Um, I, I do like that. Right, let's get on to, um, no, I was saying about the, the Burgundian influence. Uh, the next two are Pinot Noir, but they're not from Burgundy. Uh, first one is Slovenian. Uh, Modri Pinot, which I think is a, a regular, normal Pinot Noir. Uh, but if it's not, I'll, uh, I will flash something up on screen. Um, and 2011 uh, from uh, Stajeska in Slovenia. And the Pulis Winery. I was talking about cherries on the previous one. I get that gentle, sappy um, cherry character coming through here. Uh, a little bit of um, stalkiness is maybe the, the wrong word about it, but it feels like there's um, uh, something here that is uh, young, fresh and crunchy. And, um, yeah, it smells like it's going. It's, there's a character here that's going to uh, make it more of a, a, a wine for uh, drinking... When it, when it's young and fruity, I, th I think that as it got to got a little bit older, maybe that ever so, that stalkiness would uh, poke out a little bit. But while it's young and perky, it smells like it's going to be okay. Well, it's funny tasting that after the more gone. Uh, different grapes, different countries, uh, but uh, it's almost like they're built the same. Uh, there is this uh, structure. And then the fruit on top of it, and there's a crunchiness about the fruit. Where I think the Morgon scores over here, 
uh, over this one is here that structure is uh, it, it's got that little, I was just talking about smelling that slight stalkiness it's got that and that makes me think that as the wine ages that character maybe will poke out a little bit I'm very prepared to be proved wrong but um, uh, I like the flavors and I think if you get it, get this uh, before it's done any uh, too much more aging while the, all the fruit is at that you know, fresh juicy vibrant cherry raspberry um, uh, spectrum then uh, it'll be enjoyable uh, and again that, that idea of having it with sweet fatty food um, go down well let's see uh, our, what our second Pinot is like so we're in California now uh, this is Marimar Estate 2009 uh, La Masia from uh, Russian River Valley give this one a whirl and this is a very different beast. It's um, it's big, ripe. It's plush. It's got that velvety, um, velvety vanilla uh, from uh, a combination of, um, of of oak aging, uh, but also ripe, opulent fruit in the in the first place. Uh, I have a, I've a troubled relationship, I'd say, with the Marimar Torres wines. The ones I like, I tend to like best, are the ones where they've done least to them. So they do a Chardonnay that's called. Acero, is it? Uh, which is unoaked, and that's usually my favourite of, the, of their set of Chardonnays. I don't know where this Pinot fits in their uh, roster of, of Pinot Noirs. Um, it smells like it's going to be on that richer, fleshier, opulent style, almost that wants to be um, Chateauneuf du Pape rather than wants to be Burgundy. Um, and um, is that a problem? Uh, well, I suppose it's what you're expecting from Pinot Noir. I'll taste it and uh, see what, what I think there. And it, it is... Oh, um, I find it too big. Uh, I, the the, the flavours are rich, juicy, velvety. Oh, it sounds like uh, nothing wrong with that as a wine, except uh, that there are quite a lot of other grapes that uh, that do rich, juicy, velvety. Um, not many others do. Uh, Pinot, Pinot Noir for me should have a daintiness about it, um, and here it just feels like I, I feel. Yeah, I feel sort of slightly galumphing feet uh, going through the whole making of it. I would like to have seen it uh, lower in alcohol, uh, less of that opulence, more of the fresh daintiness. Um, uh, I, I, I know a lot of people will, will absolutely love that style, but for me, it's um, there are other Pinots that have a fresher fruit profile. Here it's getting into that real overripe, um, I mean, it's not it's not quite on the jammy spectrum, but it's it's got it feels like the the where the, the, the things are starting to look heavy on the vines on 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 the trees, and as if they're going to drop off any second with the uh, merest gust of wind. I want a little bit of uh, I want a little bit of bite in my wines, and uh, maybe I miss that here. Final two. Um, we are well for the first one. We're back in uh, Slovenia with the Pulis Winery. Um, and um, this is Gamay, so the, the grape that was in the Beaujolais, uh, but Gamay mixed with Modra Frankinja, um, which you may not may or may not know under that name, but you might know it as either Blau Frankish uh, or Kick Frankosh um, or Lemberger. Um, so um, I don't know whether it's a 50-50 blend, but uh, anyway, let's just dig in and see where we get to. Oh, I've just seen it. This is only 13% alcohol. Maybe it should have been. Maybe it should have been earlier in the tasting, but hey, give it a whirl. Now this smells young and crunchy, and this this is uh, it, it's uh, sometimes Blau Frankish can make really quite big uh, beefy wines uh, in Austria um, and in in particular. But here um, it feels um, that it's on that fresh, young, uh, bouncy, vibrant style, um, as in uh, uh, as good young Beaujolais. There's a touch of spice in there. There's the plumminess. Um, there's there's something that's almost um, uh, not quite not red fruit related. It's something like um, quince. Uh, some some strange element coming in there among the berries, among among the plums. Um, is it even something like lychee? Um, but uh, I, I I really like that. I, I like its youthful vigour. Um, and uh, the, 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 you, you get the impression that it's, it's a reasonably full fruited wine, but it's not trying to assault you with uh, alcohol. Um, it feels like there's, there's no oak or anything there to uh, muddy the waters. And uh, yeah, darn good drink. And uh, yes, I, I'm going to have another drink of that. If you think about wines like the Zweigelt uh, from Austria or Dolcetto from uh, from Piemonte in, uh, in northwest Italy. It's that idea of a good, gutsy, uh, fruity, but tastes of a place 
E wine. Thumbs up. Right, final one. Um, we are in um, Turkey here. Uh, so this is Kaya Cappadocia um, and from the... Uh, here, here we go, embarrass myself. Uh, Gok Kokabag winery uh, made from the grapes Ogus Gozu and Bogaskeri. Uh, Og Ogus Gozu. Um, it's got eight letters and it's got four umlauts on. Is that a record? Anyway, 2012. Um, and why have I put it here? Well, because it says on the back, think of the velvet texture of Burgundy and the grip of the wines from the southwest of France and you get an idea of this great Cappadocian red. Let's have a see whether it lives up to its billing. And it smells like I've got it in the right um, in the right tasting. It feels almost like um, a well, it's got that earthy cherry character, which was which I, which I've found in quite quite a lot of the uh, the wines here. Uh, it feels also like there is something uh, ever so slightly ferrous about it. There's a, this touch of um, uh, nice rust. Does that make sense? Let's taste it and see. It's got the cherry earthiness coming through. It's got this soft plummy warmth. Uh, it got, you get that feeling that it's from a warm place, uh, but that the grapes that have been uh, that, that it's made from are ones that are adapted to that. So um, uh, it doesn't feel like uh, they've been uh, forced too much uh, you know, to, to get too ripe in order to to uh, uh, develop those rounded, large, soft flavours. Uh, and I, when I talk about soft flavours, what I mean, uh, it, I, I don't mean that they're sort of uh, uh, profligate or anything like that. What I mean is that they, 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 the flavours are soft, warm and heady, but there's still a, a bit of um, grip and sharpness about them. There, there is a tan in there and it doesn't feel like they've anything's gone overripe. Um, and I, I, what I, I'd be very interested to see how a wine like that ages. I, I'm, I'm, my concern would be, is it just too soft and forward now in terms of those fruit flavours? And as the structure softens, maybe those fruit flavours will just get Ooh, a bit too tired, uh, but um, it does look really nice now. Um, mm, I'm just trying to think about whether it's my favourite. I, I like that, and I like the Morgon. Uh, I like the Gamay from Pullis. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty nice tasting actually. And uh, no Burgundies here, but the Burgundian thread carried through from one to six. Hey, see you soon.